this last session, um, in a way, it's in order to draw things together. I'm going to fo be focusing much more on uh, helping bereaved people, what we can do to uh, put into practice some of the ideas that I've been touching on up to now. It involves prevention of health problems in bereavement, research evidence for effectiveness and the roles of healthcare teams. Because most of the problems, most of the uh, research has been focused on mental health problems, we haven't perhaps paid enough attention to what you might call the positive aspect of bereavement, the resilience, the growth, emotional growth, um, the way in which people are matured by bereavement. And I think that's something worth remembering. Um, we talked about somatic symptoms, which may be aggravated. There's a, some of the recent work on resilience is still going on, and I'm hoping it'll come up with some interesting findings. Up to now, there's not a great deal in that area, but I mentioned it as something that uh, I hope will bear more fruit. Let's just look at, first of all, primary prevention. That's care given before and after bereavement in the hopes of preventing problems later. Secondary prevention, which is focused on the bereaved people at special risk that we've touched on. And tertiary prevention, which is what you might call early diagnosis and the management of, of health problems, preferably as they occur, rather than years later, as so often happens in, in uh, medical and psychiatric work. We oft I've often felt that I wish I'd seen this person 10 years ago when their wife died or whatever. Now, in theory, primary prevention occurs from the time when you're teaching children about death. And I've already touched on some of the ways in which we may be able to help pe prepare children for losses. Um, and I've also mentioned the possibility that, that rather than overprotecting them by keeping them away from the hospital where somebody may be dying, um, the fact of visiting someone in hospital, whether it's a child or a grown-up, may actually be one of the ways in which children can begin to be prepared. Unexpected and untimely loss is much more likely to lead to psychiatric problems. And the implication of that, of course, is that the more we can help people to prepare for loss, before it happens, anticipating it, the less likely they are to have difficulties. And since members of the healthcare teams are around at such times, this gives us a special opportunity which may not be possible for other professionals. I believe we have a key role to play in people to prepare not only for their own death, but for the deaths of the people they love. And I work very closely in several different hospices over the years where this is part of the staff role. Ca illnesses like cancer invade a family, they don't just invade a patient. And if one can see the um, problem as being one, you know, help for the family helps the patient, help for the patient helps the family, it's a reciprocal thing which means essentially that rather than adopt the traditional medical model of the doctor and the nurses look after the patient and they treat the family as a bit of a nuisance or an, at best as an optional extra that they'll take on if they've got time. We should engage with the family right from the outset and be with them through the transition that they're approaching before, during and after the patient's death. I remember as a young psychiatrist, I was working in, in Boston on the Harvard Bereavement Project. I was visited by an English ex-nurse, now a doctor, who was starting a new place to care for the dying. And uh, she said, you know, when I'm with my patients and families, I get to know the families very well. But then the patient dies and I have to say goodbye to the family just when they need me most. And she said, I want you to help me to create a therapeutic community 
for families invaded by cancer. And that was St. Christopher's Hospice, which became the first of the hospice movement and has actually changed um, palliative care, the care of the dying, uh, now across the world. It's been extraordinary. It's been wonderful to be involved with that right from the outset. It's understandable, as long as the patient's alive, he's going to be the focus, or she's going to be the focus of attention. And the families themselves will say things like, oh, don't mind about me. He's the one we have to be caring for. Because this is their last chance to make up for any failures or to do the caring. Um, we shouldn't be too keen to rush in and take over. Uh, doctors and nurses are so good at our jobs that we often make the families feel de-skilled. But uh, the more we can involve them in the care, and the more we can recognise that that may, may not be easy for them, uh, the better. Um, most people, when they're well, would say, I'd rather die at home than die in a hospital. The fact remains that most people die in hospitals rather than the homes. And as they get closer to death, they may actually be, become a bit more keen to go into a place where people will be more expert than their family are. Having said that, home care can be the best place for a person to die, or it can be the worst, depending on the circumstances. And um, members of the caring profession who are around at such times uh, have very important roles to play. As long as the patient is alive, the family will sacrifice their own welfare and deny or minimise their problems. We shouldn't be fooled into thinking that doesn't mean to say that they don't have the problems. We need to need to put the patient first. Support for the patient helps the family. But we also need to remember that support for the family helps the patient. And we need to assess the needs of both. Uh, 